The following program is a production of Truth for the World. Ye servants of God, your master proclaim and publish abroad his wonderful name, the name of victorious, of Jesus sextol. His kingdom is glorious, he rules over all. We are looking at the idea of the beginning of divided worship. The beginning of divided worship. What do we mean when we're talking about divided worship? We're really talking about approaching God, which is what worship is, but doing it in different ways. And it started as early as the first children that we read about in the Bible, with Cain and Abel. In Genesis chapter 4, Adam and Eve being the first man and woman, Adam knew his wife, Eve, she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So in a nutshell, the two brought their offerings to the Lord. Cain brought what he produced, and Abel brought what he dealt with, the, the animal. They approached God, and they gave him their sacrifices. But even though they both approached God, even though they both attempted to sacrifice to him, they did it in different ways. And obviously, as we see from Scripture, Abel's sacrifice was accepted and Cain's was rejected. We may conclude very easily from this example all the way back in this early time period that bringing anything you want to God is not necessarily acceptable to Him. Bringing anything you decide to God is not necessarily acceptable to him. In other words, we may only bring to God what is acceptable to God. Another clear example from Scripture, we're going to see in the book of Leviticus chapter 10, if you'd like to turn there. Anything you want is not necessarily acceptable to God. And when we worship, we are bringing something to God. We are approaching the superior being. We, the inferior, are approaching the superior being. And we have this same principle in our everyday life. The inferior does not determine how to approach the superior. Try it with your boss at work if you want. Just bang on his door and walk right in, plop on his seat and put your feet up on his desk and say, hey, I'm here. Let's talk. Let's talk raises. (laughs) He might have a different thing to talk about called a pink slip. (laughs) Try that in the military. Bang on the general's door as a private. Let yourself right on in and go in and whenever you want to and approach the superior. See how that works? We don't do that in everyday life, do we? Why would we do that in religion when we approach the creator of the universe? Anything we want to bring is not necessarily acceptable to approach God. We may only bring to God what is acceptable to him. Look at Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. 
Notice what God said. I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. What does that mean? To those who are approaching me. When you approach me, you will do it in the right way. You may not approach God any way you decide to see fit. There are innumerable ways that you can approach God. But in both instances, Cain and Abel, Nadab and Abihu, it is apparent God desires one way to be approached, and that's his way. Nadab and Abihu chose to do it their way. It says they offered strange fire, meaning unauthorized fire. Well, if there's an unauthorized fire, then that means what? There must have been an authorized fire. As far as I can understand in my head, you can't have an unauthorized fire unless you have an authorized fire. If there was no specification on what to do, then anything would go. But instead, they brought forth an unauthorized fire, meaning there was an authorized way to do it, and they chose to ignore it. God gave instructions on His way. They just chose to disregard it. And that's our point. God gave instructions. God had given instructions for Cain and for Abel on how he was to be approached in worship with offerings. Now this isn't just speculation. We can understand this very clearly from Scripture. God gave instructions to Cain and Abel. They did not approach him saying, well, here's what it is. Here's what I've got. I hope this works. I don't know if it's right. I don't know if it's wrong. Let's just take this to God and see what happens. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Now, of course, the next follow-up question is, How did Abel get faith? By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. Well, how did he get faith? We know from Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Abel could not have offered a more excellent sacrifice to God by faith if he had not received words from God. Whether he got it directly from God or whether God had given it to Adam and Adam passed it on to Cain and Abel. However it happened, faith comes from the word of God, and the Bible says when Abel offered it, he offered it by faith. That means he offered it according to the instructions that God had given. And that's how he offered a more excellent sacrifice by which he was accepted. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. Now well, you'll understand why we're looking at this verse in just a moment, but let's break this down. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. What is righteousness? The definition by Psalm 119, 172 is the commandments of God. All thy commandments are righteousness. So let's back up and look at that verse again. If we can substitute the definition of righteousness with the, or or substitute the word rather, righteousness by its definition and just say commandments of God, then we can read this verse to say, He that doeth the commandments of God is righteous. Right? He that doeth the commandments of God is righteous. Well, what does that have to do with us? When God gives his commandments, they are righteousness. When someone obeys the righteousness of God, they are called righteous. What does that have to do with Abel? Look at verse 4 of Hebrews 11. Abel obtained witness that he was righteous. Did you see that? Hebrews 11.4, Abel obtained witness that he was righteous. How did he get righteous? By doing righteousness. Well, what's righteousness? The commandments of God. Once again, how did Abel offer his more excellent sacrifice? By faith, which he got from the word of God. How did he become righteous? By doing righteousness, which is the commands of God. 
The point being that God had given instructions for Nadab and Abihu, as well as Cain and Abel, on how he was to be approached in worship with offerings. Aaron, therefore, in Leviticus 9, verses 8 through 10, Aaron, therefore, went unto the altar and slew the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. And the sons of Aaron, which Nadab and Abihu were, brought the blood unto him, and he dipped his finger in the blood and put it upon the horns of the altar and poured out the blood at the bottom of the altar. But the fat and the kidneys and the call above the liver of the sin offering he burnt upon the altar. Why did he do all these really technical things? As the Lord commanded Moses. Don't tell me they knew how to do all these in-depth technical things. You could put this over here and you do this over here and you pull this out and you burn this and you don't eat burn that and you eat this but you don't eat that. How did they know all that? Because God gave them the instructions on how to do it. As the Lord commanded Moses. They weren't just making it up as they go along. They were following the instructions. Did Nadab and Abihu know what to do? I think they did. Not only that, but God would be an unjust God for condemning Cain, Nadab, and Abihu for not worshiping him correctly if he had not given them proper instructions. Think about that. God would be unjust if he condemned them and had not given them proper instructions on how to follow it. That wouldn't be fair, would it? Your boss tells you, here, uh, assemble this piece of machinery, and then just walks off. Well, can I have an instruction manual? No. (laughs) Are you going to show me how to do it? No. And then he comes back a half hour later, you didn't put this together, you're fired. Well, thanks a lot, that's really fair, isn't it? You told me to do something. You didn't even show me how to do it. You didn't even give me an instruction manual to read. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. And now you come back and fire me because I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah, thanks a lot. Really fair. God would be like that, wouldn't he? Condemning us if we approached him in worship had he not given us proper instructions on how to do it. Isaiah chapter forty-five twenty-one lets us know that God is a just God, a just God and a Savior. Some may believe you don't have to have Bible proof for what you practice. We don't have to go to the Scripture necessarily to show us how to worship. We don't have to have scriptural authority for how to worship. What does Abel say about that? By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Here's Abel talking to us even today, letting us know, you want to be approved of God, you need to do it according to his commandments. The example of Nadab and Abihu still speak to us today. You want to approach God, you do it on his terms. God has given instructions. It's amazing to look at the religious world around us to see the multiplicity of ways that people approach God and expect Him just to accept it no matter what they do. But God has given us instructions. We are not without instructions today on how to appropriately approach God in worship. We are not walking in in darkness. We know what we're supposed to do. We have been given through the Bible instruction in what God approves of for worship today. And those very simple acts are singing, which we read about in Ephesians 5.19, as well as Colossians 3.16 and other places. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. What does God approve of? What has he spoken in his word to say is acceptable to us? Or acceptable to him, rather. And that, as far as music goes, is singing. A woman said something to me one time, you worship at that church where you don't have music. I said, yes, we do have music. We sing. (laughs) That's the music that is authorized. It's singing. We don't use 
mechanical instruments because the instrument very specifically is specified right here. Singing and making melody in your heart. That's the instrument. Not only that, but Colossians 3.16 tells us, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Not only singing with your heart, but also the purpose of singing is very clearly seen. Teaching and admonishing and letting the word dwell in you. You can't do that with mechanical instruments. You just can't. The word does not dwell in me when I hear a mechanical instrument play. And as I've said before, the only thing I can teach you with a guitar is how badly I play the guitar. That's all you're going to learn from listening to me play the guitar. That's all I'm going to teach you, is that I should not play the guitar. What lessons about life and about God can I teach you by strumming a guitar? Nothing. How can I admonish you to live a better Christian life by strumming? I can't do that at all. In fact, many people, including myself, will tell you when mechanical instruments are playing, you often can't even hear the words or pay much attention to it. The message is lost over the noise. We pray because God has said prayer is acceptable. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. We also partake of the communion as Jesus instituted and Paul wrote to the Corinthian church about, For I have received of the Lord Jesus that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Bread that symbolizes the body of Christ and the fruit of the vine that symbolizes the blood of Christ. We have an approved example, not only here of the Corinthians partaking of this, but Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, they came together on the first day of the week to break bread. And therefore, if we want to be like the church of the New Testament, we do the same. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come a practice of the first century church that we imitate in order to be the same church. Preaching is also mentioned in Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Again, an approved example of Christians coming together on the first day of the week to partake of the communion, to listen to words uh, that God wants to teach his people. And last but certainly not least, giving. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Paul told the church in Corinth, he said, the same thing I'm telling the churches over in Galatia, do this on the first day of the week. Therefore, we have our approved examples. This is what the church was doing, and we want to be the church that we read about in the New Testament, and therefore we do the same. In conclusion, Jesus said something very significant in John chapter 4 and verse 24. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must. The word there in the Greek really may mean it is necessary. Same idea, must. It's necessary. Necessary evokes the idea of there's not really another option. Right? It's necessary that you do this. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him two ways. In spirit, with the right attitude, and in truth. 
Well, let's define in truth. Who decides what truth is? What is truth? Jesus defined it in John seventeen seventeen. Sanctify them through thy truth, speaking to God. Thy word is truth. So let's put two and two together. If the word is truth, and Jesus said they, we must worship in truth, what does that mean? We must worship according to the word of God. Now, does that harmonize with the story of Cain and Abel? Sure. Abel offered by faith, meaning according to the word of God, and his offering was accepted. Does it harmonize with the story of Nadab and Abihu? It does. They offered strange, meaning unauthorized fire, and that was not accepted. Abel offered according to the word of God, and it was accepted. Cain, Nadab, and Abihu offered different from the word of God, and it was not accepted. That's something to think about because when we worship, we don't need a divided worship. Ever since Cain and ever since Cain and Abel, worship has been divided. You know, if we think about it and look at all the different ways that religion approaches God in worship today, and we think, look at all these different ways that people are approaching God in worship. You know what? It's been that way since the beginning. Cain and Abel came and said, we're going to do it in different ways and we're just going to see what happens. Well, it didn't work out too good when you didn't do it God's way. But ever since that same time, not only has worship been divided, but ever since that same time, one type of worship has been rejected by God and the other type has been accepted. And the one that has been accepted by God is the one that is in line with his instructions. Worship to God is an approach to God to honor Him, to praise Him, to show our love to Him. Believe it or not, it's not about me. It's not about me getting what I want. People say, I didn't get much out of worship today. Well, there's different ways to think about that. One, how much did you put into it? And second of all, even if I didn't get anything out of worship... Was I the audience of worship? Was I the one that was being approached in worship? Was I the one receiving worship? Or was it really supposed to be about somebody else? Namely God. And if God is the audience of our worship, and if God is the one who's supposed to receive the love, the honor, and the respect, wouldn't it make more sense just to do it in the way that pleases Him and not me? It'd be like giving a birthday gift to somebody and giving them something that I really like and they hate. Right? If my wife hated, uh, you know, bowling, and I got her a bowling ball with my name engraved on it. You know, happy anniversary. Doesn't make sense, does it? I'm giving you a gift and approaching you in a way that I'm supposed to be showing you love, honor, and respect, but what am I really doing? Whatever pleases me. Whatever pleases me. Well, if that doesn't work with my wife, why would it work with God? Why would I be able to go to God and say, I want to show you my love, honor, and respect. Now you just sit there and listen because I'm going to do whatever in the world I want. I don't care if you like it or not. That doesn't make any sense. If I really want to show somebody love, honor, and respect, I'll do what pleases them, not what pleases me. Do we please God with our worship? Do we do it according to His Word? It's dark. You're in ancient Egypt. God is going to be coming through soon. You've killed the lamb and put the blood on your doorposts. You know that God has promised to pass over your house and spare the life of your firstborn. But the final plague of God against Egypt will come through and bring death to those who have not had the blood applied to their house. You wait and know that you are safe. It's light. You're back in modern times. You know that God is going to be coming through soon. You've been baptized into the death of Christ. You've come into contact with his death where his blood was shed. You've washed your robes white in the blood of the Lamb. You know that God has promised to pass over you and spare your life. But the final day of judgment against the world is coming. Death will come to those who have not had the blood applied to them. You wait and know 
that you are safe. If you would like a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth for the World or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org. In a world where political, economic, and social instability seem to be the norm, how can anyone find happiness and peace of mind? Well, you begin by changing your focus from worldly things to those things that are from above. Paul said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11. True contentment is obtained not by things of this world, Although Satan would like nothing more than for you to believe that you can only be happy when your political party is in power, when you're making more money than you're making now, and when your social status is better than it is presently. Christ said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. And what are the things that will be provided? Everything that you need to be content in this world. If you would like a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth For The World, or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org. Religion can be confusing. Just to drive down the street and we see church after church. How do we choose? How can we find the truth? Truth For The World can help you. Visit truthfortheworld.org for biblical answers to your questions. No man-made doctrines, no opinions, just straight Bible teaching. Articles, audio files, television programs, and educational courses, all free and available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Visit us online at truthfortheworld.org. Does God care if we have a balanced budget? Does God care if we save the spotted snow owl? Does God care if we build a new road to replace the old one? Well, God certainly cares about us. He certainly cares about how we use the resources he has given us, but God also cares whether or not we are keeping his commandments. Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Would keeping his commandments include not murdering innocent babies in abortions? Would keeping his commandments include not practicing homosexuality? Certainly they would, as God has spoken to us in the Bible that these things are wrong. So when we stand before God on the day of judgment, do you think he will judge us by how well we kept our roads or whether we saved the spotted owl? If you would like a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth For The World or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org. Use your time on Facebook to learn about the book. Join us on Truth For The World's Facebook page. You can visit with others, ask Bible questions, read the Bible, listen to audio and watch video programs, and so much more. We're posting new information weekly and have many resources to help you. We would love to hear from you. Visit our Facebook page at facebook.com slash truth for the world. If you would like a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth for the World, P.O. Box 241, Bethel Springs, Tennessee. 38315, the United States of America. Or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org.